Erev Tov, I'm Stephen Ben Danoon, and you're watching Israeli News Live. Earlier this afternoon, I had a phone interview with Barry Chamesh, or Barry Chamesh as most people know him by, an Israeli journalist, a world winning uh, investigative journalist, also an author of multiple books, including The Murder of, or Who Murdered Yitzhak Rabin. Barry, though, gave a very insightful interview about the current crisis in Israel the possibility of what it could escalate to, as well as the assassination of the three young Israeli boys. I say assassination, actually the murder of three young Israeli boys. And also a new insight look on the killing of the Palestinian boy and his cousin that was ironically caught on camera of him being beaten, a boy that spoke perfectly good English. Very interesting inside look at this. And what could be or what may be happening in the cause of the war or the conflict that we're having in the Middle East between Hamas and Israel. In fact, the interview was so insightful, I found it more important to listen than to comment. I think you need to hear what you're about to hear. And I just want to give you a, a bit of warning. It can be disturbing to realize what really goes on behind the scenes. And perhaps this, well, not just perhaps, we know this is one of the reasons why Barry Chamish is actually in America now. A natural Israeli fought in the, Lebanon, in the war with Lebanon, but had to flee his own country for his own safety, for telling the truth. Let's see what he has to Good say. Good evening, friends. I'm Stephen Ben Danoon, and you're watching Israeli News Live. We have with us uh, guest Barry Chamish, who, Chamish, who is an Israeli uh, journalist. He's a world-class investigative journalist, author of many books, uh, which we'll post some of those on the screen for you here. Uh, Israel Betrayed is one of my favorites, as well as Who Murdered Yitzhak Rabin. Oh, that is the one that got me. Yeah, all right. Uh, Israel <laughs> Betrayed is pretty good, but Who Murdered Rabin uh, got me a bestseller. Uh, it was number one in Israel. It wasn't uh, slept aside as a conspiracy book. Uh, it was taken very, very seriously, and I had to be hushed up. But yeah, that's the big one when it comes to uh, renown is Who Murdered Yitzhak Rabin. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Barry, I, I, I cherish his opinions. Uh, he's uh, straightforward, no nonsense. And uh, Barry, I, I'd like to just talk to you, uh, get your opinion on the war going on in Israel right now. What's your thoughts on it and where do you think it's headed? Yeah, I'm about to, to write it up because there's simply the analysis is it, terrible. Uh, look, those who... You know, I've got a website, BarryChambers.com. Read the last article I wrote about the abductions of the three Israeli uh, teenagers. Now, that was a, a god-awful uh, act, putting it mildly. But more to the point, one of the teens, the four, somehow, don't ask how, I've got bearing information. And how, nonetheless, he phoned the police and said, we're being abducted, uh, abducted, help us. Now, I'm not gonna go into GPS, but every cell phone has GPS. That crime maybe not stopped. Maybe the kids would have been killed anyway, but it wouldn't have got off the ground. There would be, if the police had acted like the police, exactly. uh, that uh, crime would never have taken place. There would have been cruisers surrounding uh, the abductees within two, three minutes. If the police act like police, now we start with the first very, they're promising in Israel. It got out, by the way, the police opened their mouths, honest cops opened their mouths. The police viewed this as a phone call from pranksters. I'm not going to go into, uh, you have a police in Israel getting a call uh, from Gush Etzion. Uh, they're not going to be pranksters saying that they're being abducted for a good joke. I mean, what's the joke there? There's going to be a commission of inquiry, which will be a cover-up, I assure you. But that got the ball rolling. Now, you want to talk about a, a setup for a war. Now, in the wake... By the way, the recording uh, uh, was broadcast uh, 
back to all the Israelis. Many weeks later, two and a half weeks after the uh, the minister for police promised that he'd release it, it was released, and it's it's awful. You hear the gunshots. Gun you hear the Arabs. Uh, uh, celebrating and the whole country heard this now okay there was anger but the next setup it was all filmed now here's the part that oh it's listen the cops they're complicit i'll bet you anything it wasn't an accident without their help the crime couldn't have taken place for some reason they want these dead kids that's what I say. And by the way... Wow. I, you know, but I can I, believe that, though, Barry, because there's there's too many strange things that are happening in, in, in our in our country right now. And, uh, which country? Well, I'm talking and about Israel, 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 because, Barry... Now, well, let me, I don't want to interrupt now. you. You keep going. I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right, the next phase... Now, here's what happens. The day after... Uh, we don't know they're dead. I knew they were dead uh, simply because uh, the Israeli record, uh, abductees don't live. Uh, but if you haven't heard from them and there are no ransom demands, they're dead. But the Israelis and the Jews got weird. They started printing shirts, bringing back our boys and both. It was from another world. But, all right. They had hope or whatever. This hope is going to lead to uh, their demise. Exactly. But I knew, I knew they weren't alive. But it doesn't matter. Someone took responsibility for the abductions. They didn't say murders yet. Uh, that would be gleaned in time. But a branch of ISIS in Hebron took. Well, first they phoned uh, Reuters, then they phoned Fox TV. I mean, it wasn't an unpublicized uh, admission. They took responsibility, an ISIS group in Hebron. I'm not going to dive into ISIS right now. That's okay, and the, Quite all right. It's, it gets very complicated. Read my article, uh, my recent article, the fact that the murders of the three boys were from Hebron and not from Gaza. That's the part that uh, Israel immediately blamed Hamas. ISIS takes responsibility and Israel blames Hamas. Now look, you're talking about shooting rockets at Israel. You're not talking about responsible government, all right? You've got to be nuts. If you think there's not going to be retribution, uh, that, that you you take on, as the bodies are kidnapped, the rockets start flying from Gaza. Now, look, guy, you don't have to be a genius to know uh, you're going to be hit back. They're tickling Israel. But here's the setup. And... Follow this. Now, next, to get the war really going, apparently you need to get the Arabs all uh, kicked off. And they were in a tough situation, murdering uh, three teenage hitchhikers. Uh, didn't put them in a good light. So they figured, what the hell, let's just uh, change the uh, agenda a little bit and get one of ours killed. Look, a 15-year-old kid, his name was Muhammad Abu Qadir, uh, was murdered brutally. But here's the part. His murderers were filmed, and it went all over the Arab world. He, he, two of them, anyways, that I saw. And the police somehow had filmed the murderers of Muhammad Abu Qadir. Now, the next day... Now, get this for coincidence. His cousin, I think his name was Tyrick. I don't even want to know his name because he was set up. He is beaten uh, by Israeli soldiers. And it's filmed. There are so many incidents. This one gets filmed. The cousin to the victim. Now, he's 
gets into prison. Now, he gets out after three days and he's obviously beaten up. And he, well, in short, he speaks beautiful English. What do you know? He's from America. And what, what was she doing uh, at this uh, riot protest, wherever it was? He was enjoying a good riot. I was just saying, you know, what's yes. your riot? And he says this so innocently. And then his mother says, how could they beat up this poor, sweet, innocent boy? And I just saw them reading from from top cards. What oh a gosh. frame up. Everything is filmed. Everything in perfect English. The cousin just, look, just being the cousin of the murder victim, the odds are good. I mean, really, that he's going to be the one filmed and he's going to be the one arrested and he's going to speak beautiful English. This is a frame up for war. But now we'll go to the next part. And Barry, the sad thing is, is the American public, uh, the me when they get the media here, because, you know, they never want to report on uh, the evils that are happening to the Israeli people. They only want to they only want to bring attention to what happens to the Palestinians. And I mean, it just really is irritating to even well, see that. Well, to do the evils happening to the Israeli people, it's largely from their own uh, governors. Um, if you want to get down to real truth, uh, then you have to start stripping the surface. The first thing I'm saying is this whole, it was a frame up for war. Everyone was ready for it. Now look, the, the boys are, who killed Muhammad Abu Qadir, they are captured within a day or two, a lot better than the uh, uh, Israeli police did in, in stopping the murder of, of their own boys, but neither here nor there, they were not allowed counsel. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I saw that. that. What's that? I, I saw that in the, in the, uh, the newspaper there, that they were, uh, they were not allowed counsel in the beginning. Uh, I, I believe because not allowed counsel to this day. Allow me to continue. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Now he, here is uh, this is the report that's largely accepted as the end of the fairy tale. I'm just going to read it to you now. Whether I believe it, I wouldn't say so. It's by Lyle Leibovitz. It's from Tablet, but it summarizes who murdered. Abu Qadir, and here's the uh, the uh, uh, quote. Like uh, so many of the narratives beamed out of the Middle East by pale Western journalists who know so painfully little about the region and its inhabitants, this story, too, is difficult to understand. If you want to understand the gruesome murder of 16-year-old Muhammad Abu Qadir at the hands of six young Israelis last week, don't turn to Bibi or the Bible or Hamas or to Abbas. Turn to Beitar Yerushalayim, and the favorite soccer team of Israel's undivided capital. All six suspects are fanatical Beitar fans. Members of the murderous cabal are all affiliated with the, the Familia, a small group of several thousand Beitar fans known for their anti arab <coughs> opinions and a more general pension for thuggery. The truth is that, now here's the, their version of the truth. The truth is that Benjamin Netanyahu, the Palestinian Authority, Seth the rabbis and the Hamas all have nothing to do with the terrible events that unfurled after six lowlifes forced a sweet-faced kid into their car and burned him alive. Soccer explains it. And now, uh, what an analysis. So please, enough with the ancient hatred and the cycle of violence. The death, the death of Muhammad Abu Qadir is a terrible tragedy, but it's not one unique to Israel. Anyone who watches soccer more frequently than a few matches every four years understands that intuitively. No, they don't. <laughs> All right. Uh, I mean, that's a weird opinion. But as far as anyone knows, six... Uh, 
it, uh, Jerusalem kids are under arrest without representation uh, for killing Abu Qadir. That's the story. Everything here is such. Look, this is the least of the setups. The most is that the kid that was killed happened to have a cousin who happened to have shown up uh, for his memorial riot, who happened to be beaten up in front of the camera, who happened to speak beautiful uh, English, who happened to be American. All of this may sound like the natural events of a war unfurling. It's not natural, it's a frame up. Now let me ask you this, I, I did hear, and I've not been able to confirm this, but uh, that it was said that when they interviewed uh, the mother and the uh, father of the victim, the Arab young man there, that uh, the father had said that it was uh, Arabic boys that kidnapped their son and the mother claimed that it was Jewish. Did, did you ever hear about that? Oh, uh, the initial stories, uh, there were all kinds of versions. This is what we're getting and this is what we're stuck with. All right, now. You've got the war starting, not from ISIS, again, who accepted responsibility for the kidnapping and the murder of the three Israeli teenagers. Uh, maybe a little action in Hebron here and there, but the real action is in Gaza, where they start really shelling Israel. I mean, really, you're talking 170 rockets went off yesterday. 170. Now this, the Iron Dome, which, well, either this is the best commercial I've ever seen for a piece of military equipment, um, or it works. Uh, but they're not succeeding in killing Israelis. And they... I would have thought 170 would have led to thousands of casualties. This is the real war going on right now. Now, you have to understand, they call the 40,000 uh, Israelis, uh, it's called Milouin, it's reserves. Right. They call the 40,000, they're surrounding the Gaza Strip right now. Now, you've got Israeli politicians saying, are you out of your mind? We don't enter Gaza. That place, we're going to see our, our, our boys get killed like crazy there. Uh, listen, I've been to Gaza uh, as a soldier as well. As it, it, Hamas has got traps everywhere, explosives everywhere, snipers everywhere. And, well, you've got uh, members of Knesset like Danny uh, Danone and Moshe Feiglin and said, whatever you're doing, we control Gaza's water and electricity. Shut it off until the rockets stop. What are we going in for? We don't have to go in. We'll take care of them with our rockets. Kill them. Don't send our sons into a war. Now look, this is very, very logical and very hard to dispute this logic. Now look what Netanyahu says. Uh, the headline is, when law, uh, lawyers run the war, you can't put... Prime Minister Netanyahu said that his lawyers won't let him shut off gases, water, and electricity. Oh, my like, God. Uh, Israel's getting good PR uh, from the last five days of uh, killing something like 170 Arabs. Uh, that's uh, much better PR than if they cut off their electricity. That... Look, it's beyond logic with us. What would the lawyers say is wrong with that? All right, but here is, here is where, I don't know what to call this. It's not just a confrontational trick or here, all right, here, I'm just going to read the headline from the Hebrew. On Tuesday, July 8th, 148 trucks carrying supplies and 221 tons of natural gas entered Gaza. Remember, the rocks have started already. The trucks went via the Kerem Shalom crossing with the coordination of, well, of the Gaza liaison office. That's not the point. The point is, while Israel 
is pummeling Gaza. Israel is also supplying it with its electricity, water, food, and supplies. <laughs> because Netanyahu says his lawyers won't cut him cut that off, cut that out. Since, since when does well, since when does uh, Israel get governed by attorneys? I mean, this is absurd, Barry. No, no, this is just plain mainstream middle of the road headlines. This is uh, <laughs> you may call it absurd, but that is exactly what's happening. Gaza is getting their electricity from Israel. They can shut off the taps. There'll be no water. You can actually first out gas. There are ways you don't have to start a war. You don't have to endanger your children. All kinds of things that are not being done. The opposite is being done. Gases are being fed, and Israelis are surrounding them. All right? Now, it, could it be possible, Barry? I mean, I, I'm just curious as I, as I listen to you tell this, is... Is there a possibility that what they're doing is they're using Gaza as a testing uh, game to determine whether or not the Iron Dome uh, that they have is really going to work in the it's case of the invasion? The it's, it's not out of the question. Uh, it, it's, I don't know if it's the first factor, but they're certainly getting good PR for that system. I thought of that as well. Would they send their children? Listen, once it's infantry, uh, the Iron Dome will fade away, and an ugly war will replace it. And I, I fear uh, that's what's coming up. Now, look, you have to... Say this, well, by the way, what's notable... How much did I get wrong after all these many years where people can't fault me? And this, and boy, do I have enemies who try to. They can't fault my, look, I'm an old fashioned journalist. I gather evidence, I corroborate it. And if I'm being specious or speculating or anything like that, I say so. My books, the latest is The Stinger, Not the Stung. That was nine months ago. That's the latest. They're all at lulu.com. That's www.lulu.com. You'll get there, you'll see a search box. Write in books, and then my name, Shamish. C-H-A-M-I-S-H. And I've got a website. I'm lucky. I've got a conscientious webmaster, David Samarin. Uh, it, I'm not technical. I'm old. Uh, high tech has passed me by. Uh, I couldn't do it without him. It's at www.barrychamish.com. And yes, there's a PayPal button. Uh, I get by by the skin of my teeth uh, thanks to... All well, I'm going to give him a plug. I don't think he wants the last thing. No, thank you, Herman. You got me through next week. Um, <laughs> well, I, one thing, I, let me just say why you're mentioning it, so too, Barry. Uh, I really, seriously, I don't just say it to say it, because uh, God knows I'm not out there promoting books and stuff very much, but when it comes to Barry Chalmish's work, it's worth the read. It really is. It's worth the money to buy the book, get it. Uh, go to his website, uh, barrychalmish.com. Uh, or, as Barry said, you can go to Lulu Books and uh, type in Books and, and Chamish, his last name, C H. Um, um, <laughs> <-M> <laughs> yes. yes, actually, Chamish is correct. Uh, Barry probably just says Chamish to make it easy for everybody else, but yeah, Chamish is right. Um, but yeah, and, and now I've got to get the new book, Barry, the, the Stinger, there. I've got to read that now. So, But continue on, though. Yes, I, I agree. It, it, your work is incredible, and and I do appreciate the old-fashioned journalistic way that you do. I know John B. Wells told me one time, he said, Steve, he says, look, the main thing you need to do when you're doing journalism work, be able to prove and to back up what you say or don't say it at all. Well, luckily, uh, in the case of Rabin, I'll give away a secret, and then I'm going to go to what you want, at least a summary. With Rabin, I got super lucky. I made the right contacts. In the end, the private investigator for Yigal Amir, he was the patsy set up for the murder. Very, very sloppy conspiracy, by the way. Um, he phoned me up one day and he said, my wife, my wife won't let me keep these documents anymore. You want them? He came over with three boxes, with everything. 
thousands of pages, ballistic, well, medical, uh, uh, holy cow, testimonies from everyone. I had the, I got real, real lucky. I got the whole story brought to my door. Okay. From there, uh, I could, I, I just broke down this. I did the trial the way it should have been done. And that's why I'm in America. Um, it, uh, by the end, I, I paid for it. Without diving into it, I didn't want to leave Israel, but uh, it got, all right, just to end, and end, the end of my stay in Israel was um, weird car accident, weird stay in a hospital, frightening stay in a hospital, and I said, that's it, my game is up. And by the way, I'm not the only one uh, who has had an ending like this. I just want to be alive and I got out of the place. Now you're talking, three weeks ago the Pope was in the old city of Jerusalem and I wrote an article and, well, everything I said what happened, happened. Now there was a Knesset uh, committee, this was on Monday, that would have been uh, four days ago, five days ago. It was revealed that this uh, uh, Knesset committee by Likud Minister Miri Regev that the Christians had received permission to hold infinite fixed prayers in David's tomb compound. It's a yeshiva on Mount Zion that used to have a status quo. And, well, well, here's the, let's just read the quote uh, from Regev. Last Thursday, the Israeli government announced there is a status quo. In practice, the Christians pray from 8 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon nonstop. Jews who want to pray there are not allowed to enter the David's tomb compound. That was, that's the new status me? I mean, it, 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 it troubles me, Barry. I mean, I, I read it myself, the same article as well, and, and I reported that here uh, as soon as that came out. I know Rabbi Cook had, uh, had released the information after he came out of the meeting, and uh, uh, I, I'm at a loss of words. I really am. I mean, it really makes you wonder uh, how much influence Rome has with Israel. Uh, makes you wonder if... Uh how much influence the Jews have over Israel. I mean, uh, that, so that's the bottom line of it. Really and truly, the, the Jewish people who love Israel, who knows this is our homeland, just like with yourself, Barry, you should be able to be there in your very homeland. It, it started to cost. It, I left the country because I didn't think I'd survive uh, much longer in that country. I believe yeah. it. I believe it, Barry. And the business was with Paris and the Vatican. Paris has been nothing but a Vatican agent uh, since he was a teenager, even before. And again, I see this I might have mentioned. He went to a Jesuit that, school in Poland. I mean, I, yeah. I'm surprised people don't. They learn, So many people know so little bit about Shimon Perez. I call him uh, the, the son of Ahab for, for going out and remarrying Jezebel and bringing her back into the country. He's got a weird history. I mean, how many Jews sent their kids uh, to Jesuit schools? You know, I come from that Polish mentality. Uh, nobody would send their kid to a Jesuit school. No, Look, no, there's no. a very, very peculiar story with Paris, but he did murder Rabin. And uh, without diving into... And you know what, tell people, go to my web, website, get my email address and write me. I'll send you my DVD of Who Murdered Rabin in English. Um, and Absolutely. It, it, it does the trick, all right? The fact of the matter is he murdered Rabin. He murdered Sharon. But in, during the 1950s, he was the head of the Israeli Atomic Energy Commission, during that period, he took every Sephardic child, 115,000 of them, and had them as guinea pigs, as, as in short, their heads were 
shame. They were taken out of school. If, a, if an Ashkenazi kid stood up to go for this ride, they were uh, told to sit down. You're not coming. It's not for you. They took this apart of kids. They blasted them with massive amounts of gamma rays through their brains. Oh, my God. Uh, by the way, you can uh, just YouTube the ringworm children. Uh, that's uh, David Belhas, and I worked with him uh, not much, a couple times. We knew each other, and he exposed it. Every Sephardic child, every one of them, they were brought to Israel. I won't tell you why. That's another story in itself. The story of the Holocaust, I won't tell you why. That's another story in itself. But if you were a Sephardic child in the 50s living in Israel, you got blasted with hundreds and hundreds of times the permissible level of x-ray through your brain. And it, it all, so the power is, well, he traded a whole race of people as guinea pigs for uh, nuclear secrets, and Israel got the bomb and it got the mono. My goodness. You know, that hits hard for me, Barry, because I, I, I am from the Sephardic uh, Jews. I mean, uh, my mother was Ashkenazi, my father was uh, Sephardic. My sister married a Sephardi. What's the difference? No, there is no <laughs> difference. I mean, Jews are Jews. It's the, it's the very fact that, you know, he did what he did. I mean, let's just face it. I mean, to me, he can't. I mean, it reminds me of Hitler. The only thing is, he's undercover. I mean, it's horrible. Oh, if you want to talk, look, I don't think we have the time, but if you want to talk <laughs> about the transfer agreement and this disgusting agreement between the labor Zionists and the Nazis uh, to get their kind of Jews out of Germany uh, with British compliance, uh, to get their uh, nation started, uh, and, and the fact that Adolf Eichmann went went to Palestine and had a grand old time at the Kibbutzim, admiring the beautiful girls, and, and then uh, when he, he was in charge of 500,000 Jews in Budapest, uh, Rudolf Kastner uh, could have freed all 500,000. He didn't want them. But Kastner said, no, here's a list. You save these guys, the rest can go to hell. Uh, he put on Nazi uniforms, went to death camps. You start getting into uh, the real history of Israel. It, it's the worst thing that ever happened to the Jews, hands down. Absolutely. Mm. Barry, let's go back. It's too late, but it's I know, too late. you're right. So now so now we have to support what we've got. I mean, that's what they left us. But if if Jews started looking at the price we really paid uh, for for this sliver of land, it it wasn't worth it. It cost us half the Ashkenazi population of the world to get the land. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, it's, we know it's true. I mean, it's just, there's nothing you can say about it. And, um, of course, I've got a lot of opinions anyway as far as what to do in Israel. I would be oust in every Arab there is, but I guess I'd get called a racist by doing that. But, uh, anyway. Barry, let's go back then to the, uh, the Vatican's role uh, in what's happening over there at the Tomb of David. We know that's uh, just uh, one of many cases. I'm just going to finish up then. Okay. I didn't prepare it. I really wanted to concentrate on the war taking place. Sure. But in short, he says his Knesset committee uh, won't allow any advancement of negotiations. Uh, everything has to be exposed before the committee and uh, crap like that is not going to happen. But the fact is, under the table, he wanted a ceremony. A w the whole world would watch Israel hand him the the key to the second floor of this yeshiva uh, where uh, David's tomb. By the way, Jesus didn't have his last supper there, and David isn't buried there. All right? And and that's simple. true. We know that. But, we know that. That's right. But nonetheless, he didn't get his little uh, turnover, and he didn't get the ceremony. There was too much opposition on the ground. So under the ground, uh, they just arranged... They said, "Don't worry about it. We'll get we'll get the Jews out. Uh, they can't 
have a synagogue with us at church. Uh, we'll get them out. It's just a matter of time. And that's what they're doing. They're getting them out. The Vatican Agreement was signed uh, in early December 1993. No, yes. Oslo was late November 93. A week later was Oslo, uh, um, early December 93. They're the same agreement. Now, I could... It, it's not all that complicated, but what it comes down to is terrorists... I dealt with Ron Poonduck. I had a meeting with him at a Tel Aviv bait cafe right after he signed the Oslo Accord and he thought I was one of him and I was with my friend Joel Bainerman and in short. Yoshi Bainerman worked behind the back of his boss. He was the deputy foreign minister. Paris was foreign minister. Rabin didn't want Paris to know about the Oslo secret meetings, so they kept it from him. Paris found out in March of 19... March, yes. By May, he sent a letter uh, to the Pope um, delivered by... Um, um, oh, my goodness. Uh, a monocultor, yes, the French intellectual, offering Jerusalem if he would come and be with him in the Oslo Peace Accords. And I got the whole story, and it's so well documented. We'll, we'll put it together later, then, the where it gives you more time to prepare it, Barry, because that's... that's, oh, that's to, a, talk about this, you need time. Right now, yes. we've got a war, and I, I'm, I'm going to say this. If Hezbollah enters, if Assad enters, if Hamas, right now they are isolated. If I were uh, uh, a gas and I would be pissed off at the world, everyone's abandoned them. But if this changes, holy moly, if this changes, and it's an all-out war from Hezbollah, Assad, and Gaza, things could get really, really, really bad for us. Well, and here's one thing. Let me just say this, Barry, in light of that, because uh, if Hezbollah gets involved in the war and as many rockets as they've been able to stockpile, like you were saying there, may, would make Hamas look like nothing there. If they get involved, if Assad gets involved and you begin to start lobbing rockets from every direction, it's almost as if what their intention is is to run the Jewish people, huddle them into one corner of Israel somewhere, trying to get more away from uh, the barrage of rockets. And, and, and in that case, I cannot help but wonder then if our people are not being set up for a massacre uh, and it's being done intentionally. Well, I'm going to say it again. Why? What lucky duckies that Hamas has no allies. Now, uh, just keep it in mind. It's Israel against Hamas. If it was Israel against the Arab world, uh, I don't even want to consider. It, it would take divine intervention, Barry. That'd be the only. That'd be our only hope outside, uh, because unless we nuke every country there is in the region, and then what good is that going to do us in the long run? Now, as I say, you get a war started, you kill Jewish kings, you film an Arab kid getting beaten by police who speaks beautiful English and suddenly you've got uh, you've got an explosion that has to stop and frankly uh, I don't know what is with they, somebody must know something that that no one would get involved it would be all Hamas Israel must have known it I don't know what's going on deep Absolutely. Barry, it's been a pleasure. I hope to get to speak to you again in the very near future. And uh, uh, friends, those that are watching, uh, it's you can see his website on the bottom of the screen here. Definitely get the books that Barry writes. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested now in the Stinger. Uh, I've got to go order that now to see more about what he writes about. An amazing journalist. 
go through his website. I know it'll be a blessing to you. Uh, anyway, Barry, thank you so much for joining us and being with us here. And my pleasure. I'm glad we finally had it.